For this video, I intend to focus exclusively on robot racing. There is a bunch of stuff to be done here, and I intend to shove it all into a single video. Uh, but it really is a lot. I'm pretty sure it'll take me a long time. So I'm going to try to not do this live, but I'll try to make shorter updates with my progress. Uh, but the plan is, I already have it written out. Uh, first of all, I have some clarifications to make about Hilbert, just some updates about my original solution. Next up, uh, there's actually a Steam achievement for this level, which is to get uh, the, the program to under 64 bytes. So I intend to do that, hopefully, if I can. And that might require some hardware changes from what I gather. It seems like it might not actually be possible with my current leg. Uh, at least, well, we'll see. There's there's a bunch of things here, actually. I could write 2B, 2C and all sorts. Uh, next up, I think it would be interesting to try to implement it non-recursively because I want to make an ASIC. And I think an ASIC will be much more efficient and much neater if... I make it non-recursive. I don't even know how I would make a recursive ASIC. Uh, so yeah, I want to try a non-recursive approach, which does exist, uh, but I'm not sure how easy it will be. So we'll see. Uh, but yeah, that's going to be the intro. And next up, Clarifications Corner. So in Clarifications Corner for robot racing, I want to go back to my original solutions and discuss them a little bit. So this is my original whiteboard, blackboard, for when I was solving Hilbert, which, by the way, there should be a pop-up for that video if you haven't seen it. This will make no sense otherwise. Uh, but I ended up going with a single solution, right? I only have one program here. And when I was... When I came up with it, with my final solution, I actually came up with a bunch of others. So my final solution came from this set of equations, right? And it turned out that they did not have a unique solution. They, in fact, had a bunch of different solutions. And I only went with one of them. So I was wondering whether the other solutions, the other, you know, sets of uh, values would actually solve Hilbert. Uh, and... Other than that, in addition to this arithmetic kind of equation-y approach, I also came up originally with a completely different solution, which does not fit any of these, at least so far as I can tell, which used local heading. And I'm also wondering if this one works. So, in fact, what I did is I didn't implement them in assembly, that would be too much. But instead, I went ahead and I made a couple of quick scripts in Python, which Python actually has turtle graphics built in. Now, let me bring this over there. Uh, so it's kind of nice. It's kind of neat that way. But yeah, I can, I can just kind of emulate assembly in Python. So for example, this right here, step. Uh, well, I guess I should first talk about walk and turn. Quite simple, you know, walk is just go forward, assuming some heading. I am intentionally using global heading to emulate assembly a little bit. So walk is just append heading mod 4. You know, turn is just add some direction, some angle to our current heading. So the solution I ended up going with, the actual assembly I currently have as my solution to the level, is based on this pink formula. And it's exactly this function, exactly this subroutine in Python, right? So we turn negative direction, then we step with size n minus one and negative direction. Then we walk, turn, so on and so forth, right? So this, this is just directly encoding that. But this is, of course, we know that this works. And what I'm actually interested in is this set of equations and this set of solutions. So just to remind you, uh, wherever that was, 
yeah, so this right here was my original kind of equation which I was solving. So I was assuming that at every point I can, I am turning by some unknown angle. So I designated A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H as unknown angles. And that gave me a system of equations, which I then solved. Now, that would correspond to this function, which I called step generalized. It's, again, quite simple. We have a turn by this A times uh, our direction, because we have left and right directions, as you may recall, right? Which flipped, you know, step R equals step L, R, R, L, and vice versa. So that's what this is. Uh, but yeah, basically, this just means that this is either A or minus A. But yeah, at every point, I turn by some A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? And we can take a look at the result. I'm just gonna draw off maybe a couple. So these solutions are exactly these sets of uh, A, B, C, D, E, right? I have them all coded in here. I couldn't be bothered to actually implement them all at the same time, but I can, oops, I can just uncomment this and I can run my helper.py. And yeah, the total draws the thing and it works. And in fact, it works for everything. So if I comment this back and I go down here and I uncomment the next one and I run it, same thing. So yeah, all these solutions were in fact valid and they all work, except they kind of need different initial parameters. They they need different initial headings, right? So this assumes a heading of three, this a heading of one, of two, and of zero. And uh, this is, wait, uh, kind of confused. No, zero, three, one, two. So these are all step generalized. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is my original local heading solution. I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'm, I've already gone into way too much, I think. But still, this is... What the hell? This is my local heading solution. It's super asymmetric, super weird, but it uses, as you can see, local heading as a local variable right here. And this just directly encodes this formula and we can test this as well. I can uncomment this stuff. Um, comment this back and run it. There. So basically I'm just at this point, I'm just proving myself right <laughs> that all of my solutions were in fact correct. Um, okay, so that will be Clarifications Corner. So next up is the question of short program. Now, my original is quite condensable as it is, but it's not going to be enough. So if we take a look again, this is uh, just corresponding to the to this formula. So we have turns in directions and we have steps. <laughs> I'm not going to explain it all over again, but there are a couple of just purely mechanical changes that we can do to optimize this. And the first thing is, since I implemented this, I actually added a call instruction to my uh, leg, which means I can just easily replace this with a call to step which I'm going to do like so. So that should still work. Yep. Right. So instead of manually saving, wait, what am I doing? Uh, this is actually not right. Yeah, I don't need these anymore. So yeah, it works. It works. So instead of manually adding stuff to the stack, then popping from stack, 
I can just use my cool new call instruction and it's it's all good. Uh, that's not all. There's at least one, probably two or even more changes that I can make to this directly. So the first thing is uh, I start at size four. So this encodes the size of the curve I need to traverse. Every time I call, I reduce size by one. But then when I reach zero, I skip. I don't do anything. This is actually not efficient. It's, it's inefficient to call a function and then skip it if it needs to do nothing. Instead, we can just not call the function, right? And thankfully, my call instruction is already implemented as a conditional one. So I can just use a condition to only call the step when the size is not zero or well, when the size is not going to be equal to zero after the sub. So what I can do is I can do not unconditional call, but instead I'm going to do um, I only call if unsigned less equals size. Yeah. So if my size is actually one is not right. Uh, unsigned less than I think is correct going to be <laughs> suddenly turning into Yoda uh, is correct going to be size one. Um, yeah, so we'll just not call when we would skip. Let me change all these and actually test that this works. Yeah, there we go. This works. And this is already shorter and more efficient. It's actually noticeably more efficient. If I just press run, the robot is much faster, right? Remember how it was quite slow before? Yeah, now it's, it's pretty speedy. So that's another thing we can do. But even that's not the end of it. There's actually a couple more tricks we can apply to save some instructions right here. So the first thing is we can notice that right is all zeros. So I don't actually need to save zeros. I don't need to zero initialize my variables. They're already zero initialized. So that I do not need. Uh, still the same. But even that is not it. I actually do not need to initialize size either. Uh, now, this is, in my opinion, a little bit of a hack, a little bit of a cheat. This is really hard coding the size of the maze into your function. But what I can do is instead of initializing size to four and then subtracting, what I can do instead is I can initialize my size to zero, then add here, right? Add one to size and subtract here. But instead of checking for greater than one, I can instead check that size is less than, I think four or three I, or five, I don't know, I might be off by one, but hopefully the idea is clear, right? I just need to gauge the depth of my calls and it doesn't matter to me whether I count the depth with larger numbers or smaller numbers. So um, let me apply this change. Yeah, this was correct. So size needs to be less than four and it works. So now we have saved a couple more instructions here and our new grand total is down to 72. Now from this point, so far as I can tell, it is not possible to reduce the program any further. I have tried for a while. I tried a few different approaches and I actually even asked around on the game's Discord. Uh, it's not that I've received a definitive proof that uh, no, you cannot do this, but basically, actually, credit where credit is due. Thank you kindly to Gelthor. 
who helped me out a bunch on this problem. Uh, I didn't, like I said, receive conclusive proof that it's not possible and nobody actually claimed that it is impossible. But judging by the fact that this person has 3587 next to their name, which I assume is the total score on the leaderboard, uh, which is ridiculous. I'm pretty sure this will require some um, one gate solutions to some levels. Um, I expect that if there was a solution, I would have received it by now, and I haven't. So I think, yeah, my question was to, um, where would it be? Yeah. Is my approach compressible to below 64 bytes without altering hardware or doing something completely different? So absolute directions, closed form solution, whatever. So my my thinking is I want to do this properly. Obviously, I can write out all the directions in the program just using, you know, just, just generate up, right, down, right, right, up, left uh, sequence, put it in the program and then make an ASIC out of that. But that seems to be against the spirit of the achievement and the spirit of this level. And what I actually want to do is I want to write an actual program that is actually below 64 bytes while not using anything special in my hardware. So I'm trying to use the regular quote unquote leg uh, to get this. But it looks like it's not going to be possible with my current leg. Now there is still hope, and I'm not sure if this will work, but there is hope. Uh, there are two things I want to mention about this. Well, one thing I want to mention and one thing I want to do. The thing I want to mention is right here. It's about this green stuff. So in my original video, when I came up with this algorithm, I was already thinking how I could potentially compress it further. And something I noticed is that it's quite symmetric and it could kind of be broken down further into smaller pieces. So if we take a look, this part, then I'm gonna use a different color. This part plus this part are kind of the same. So if we combine the two white blocks, what we get is minus direction, step minus direction, T, then step minus direction, minus direction, right? So D, step D, T, step D, D. And actually the exact same thing happens in the middle. D, step D, T, step D, D. But then there's this tiny little T, which doesn't quite fit, but still, we can kind of add a circle. Um, we can kind of separate, eliminate this part. And we notice that these two are equal to the one in the middle, which to me immediately screams, okay, you must reduce this. You must define the white stuff as its own thing and just reuse it up to the sign at D, right? So here we have the sign is uh, negative, while here all, all Ds are positive. And this is actually a valid approach. This is possible, this can work. And I did this with Python in the same way I did with my uh, optional solutions. Uh, let me show it, I guess. So. I call it step fueled. Um, I don't know how common the idea of fuel is in programming, uh, but basically when, when you don't want your function, when you recursive function to run forever, but you don't actually have any good point when to stop, you can add a thing called fuel, which you will just reduce at every recursive call. And then when you run into zero, you're gonna stop making recursive calls and this is kind of the same idea because my white block 
is actually gonna have to call itself, right? My my full thing will be calling itself, which leads to infinite recursion, and I need to know when to call this and when not to. So that's the approach. So this right here, direction minus direction, turn, step, walk, and then the outside are exactly the white blocks, right? Then this thing will call itself, and it's actually calling itself with the same size, right? Because I need the, these calls to also be the same size, except it is conditional on the fact that I actually need it, need inner, right? And when I call from outer, I need more inner stuff, right? I'm calling full steps, I'm calling full step here, and I'm calling full step here. But when I'm already inside, when I'm already in here, I only need the outer stuff, these two. I do not need the, the blue block in that call. So this is kind of the application of the concept of fuel. And it does kind of look short. And it is. It is kind of short. Uh, but And it works. I guess I can show it off real quick. Inner, inner, yeah, step fueled right here. Remove this. Right, we can run it again. There. This also works. Um, it looks short. It's kind of neat. But the problem is... I'm cheating here. Because these true and false in Python... I am using a local variable, right? I am overwriting a local variable with a constant true, with a constant false. And the same happens with the first call. But unfortunately, local variables are not free in assembly, neither in terms of uh, ticks nor in terms of instructions. And I have not been able to successfully apply this approach to reduce this program. Uh, I do have it, and actually, let me go get it. There. I'm not gonna go into the details, I've, I think I've already explained enough Python, but this is essentially what I just showed, except translated into assembly. Um, the difference is, instead of using true and false, instead of using those uh, local variables, I actually need a variable uh, a global one, which I push onto stack, then I reset it, and then I pop it from stack in order to make sure that it hasn't changed uh, in the meantime in the other call. Um, yeah, so this is it, but unfortunately, and this is also this is also applying all the other reductions I've explained before. This is also using size less than uh, four, uh, which actually. This is less than or equals. Well, that is less than. That's weird. How? No, but this works, I know. Wait, give me a moment. <laughs> I just I just realized this is completely unexpected, but it turns out unsigned less than also works somehow. It also solves the maze. But it's not it's not efficient. It's it's a dumb robot that actually does a bunch of weird stuff in between. But then it proceeds to actually solve the, the level. Right? It's sometimes it stumbles. Yeah, okay. So yeah, we want less equals here. We want less equals here. And we want less equals here. Yeah. That'll be that'll be much faster. Yeah, this is a smart robot. Actually, let me change it here as well. There. Works. So, yeah, this kind of two-level approach does work, but it's exactly the same in length. 72. 72. And I have not been able to reduce either of them. So now comes the second part of this part in which I intend to make changes to hardware. Um, this was suggested, again, by 
Um, Gelthor, at least it was hinted to me, uh, and I I can definitely see how how it will be helpful. Uh, I can make a pretty reasonable change to my leg, which will allow me to reduce this probably. I I think so. So, just how I explained with depth and how I or how I explained with fuel and how I explained with the change from size uh, 4 to 0 to size 0 to 4. I don't actually care what this number is. All this number does is it gauges the depth of recursion. It gauges how many calls I have currently going. And something I can do is I can, I am capable not right now, but theoretically, it is possible to gauge the depth of recursion directly without explicitly keeping track of it. So what, what I'm doing right now is I'm explicitly keeping track of this depth. I am adding, I am subtracting. But of course, what the depth of recursion is, in this case, when I don't push anything else to stack other than return uh, addresses, is my stack pointer. So on my stack, Stack gister. <laughs> in my stack gister, I do have this thing, which is a pointer to where I am in the stack. But right now it's completely encapsulated and I cannot access it. I cannot read it. I cannot write to it. And if I were to be able to read it, then theoretically I might not need to keep track of this to do this and instead I should be able to just compare my depth directly, you know, stack pointer, something like this, to four. And that will save me exactly the two instructions I need to save in order to get down to 64. Um, unfortunately, the Steam achievement says less than 64. Not 64 or less, but less than 64. And I'm not entirely sure if this will work, but I'm still gonna try and I still want to make this change to my leg. I want to add an ability to read and write to the stack pointer. It seems like a very reasonable change. So that'll be the next thing I do. So what I'm going to need to do, what I'm going to want to do, is I will want to expand my stack and I will be adding a whole new register interface thing, which is going to be the stack pointer. Right? Um, I want to be able to load from it. I want to be able to load to read to one and to read to two. And while I'm at it, I think I might as well implement an, a way to override my stack pointer. Now, to be completely honest, I really dislike the idea of overwriting the stack pointer, but it doesn't really cost me much. So I think I might as well implement it. And yeah, mm -hmm. now this is not going to be a difficult challenge per se, but it's going to be a difficult wiring job. So yeah, what I need is I need two more inputs like so. I want another input for my overwrite value and I will also want two more outputs here and here to get my value. I'm not sure how I'm going to position them. I'm not sure how I'm going to wire this, but I'll spare you the details. I think this is simple enough and I'll be back with an actual working solution to this. So what I decided is that probably the most reasonable behavior for this, for the stack pointer register interface, you know, the ability to read and write the stack pointer is going to be 
<laughs> it's gonna be as follows. There's there's two parts to it, of course. Uh, I need to be able to read and I need to be able to write the value of the stack pointer. Now, reading, I decided will be entirely trivial. It's a very simple, basic operation. All I do is I gauge the value of the pointer at the beginning, at the start of the tick, right? Or at the end of the previous tick, if you will. So everything that happens in the tick, pushing, popping, whatever happens, does not affect the value I get when I read it, right? So it's just read directly. And kind of the inverse is true of writing. So when I write to the stack pointer, when I overwrite it with this value, this is the value, and this is the enabler for that. Uh, what happens is, again, everything happens in the tick as normal, but the overwrite happens at the very end. So we still push, we still pop to the addresses we would expect, you know, to the previous address plus one or previous address minus one, and it's saved in memory at that address. But then, uh, well, actually, pushing will not happen, but popping can. Uh, so yeah, if I were popping, I will pop the normal expected value. And then at the end of the tick, this thing will get overwritten by its new value. Um, so yeah, it's this was a little bit of a tricky wiring job. I don't know if I want to go into the details. All in all, I'd say the stack is the most complex component I have. Like, this is a huge mess of wires, but they are all pretty necessary. And I don't see any reasonable separation here, any reasonable, you know, way to, um, you know, split it into constituent parts. It just, it's just all one big uh, system, a pretty monolithic thing. Uh, so, yeah, um, I guess one semi-interesting thing is this here. This is a decoder for the stack operation. And what it does is it orchestrates all these switches and muxes and it ensures, you know, these are three bits, right? For push, pop and overwrite. And it ensures that uh, everything happens the way I just explained. And curiously enough, I'm not gonna go into all the details. I was able to implement it using two NORs, which is, uh, this is an interesting wiring, if you ask me. Why on earth are you green though? Okay, no, you stay green, I don't care. Um, so yeah, the stack is now, the stack pointer is now accessible. And like I said, I've already tested it, but that's not actually the end of all the changes I made. One more thing I noticed when I was uh, working on this is recall how when we implemented calls, right? So in the ACON, we have this pin that is call that decides that I want to call a function, which means I am pushing a return address to the stack, right? Uh, remember how I decided that in order to push the return address to the stack, I would use the normal push interface, which was, which looks like something like this, right? Well, um, when I implemented this, the stack interface changed, right? Now I have two kind of two register interfaces here, one here and one here. Uh, they are separate and I needed to do some rewiring to make it neat. And it took me like, I don't know, 15 minutes to figure out what the problem was because it was somehow inexplicably broken. And what I realized is that this thing uh, was now in the incorrect spot when I rewired all this and I just forgot to move it one over. Um, so yeah, that's, that was the point when I realized it was not a good idea and I decided to bring it inside the stack. So now instead of going down here and enabling the thing from the outside, from leg, what I do is inside the stack, 
when I am calling, so when this call is on, uh, I am also effectively pushing. So the push line, this green thing, is an or of push or call. So that's that for the stack. Now, I've already added uh, the new instruction or the new assembly code. It's going to be SP for stack pointer. I looked it up. This is a conventional name for the stack pointer. And hopefully with it, we can reduce this program now and hopefully times two get the achievement. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do that off camera. This should be fairly simple, right? Actually, I don't need to, right? This is so simple. I uh, just call this sp.lml. I do not need to increment size anymore, right? I can remove this and I can remove this. And so instead of comparing size to step, I compare stack pointer to, to or to four, right? So all I need to do is I need to gauge the depth of my recursion. And let's see if this works. Um, it kind of does, but it's, wait a minute. It's, it looks like the same pattern uh, we got with the uh, less than versus less equals. Uh, this is... Oh, I know what it is. I know what it is. Uh, this is because I am falling into this step. Yeah. Uh, the first call, while here with, with Wolfram, with the original solution, the first call kind of counts as a call because I increment size manually. Over here, the first step does not count as a call, and so my recursion is actually one less deep. So I can just replace this with less than. Right? Let's see. Oh yeah, it's much snappier now. So we're exactly at 64 bytes. Let's see if I can get the Steam achievement. Come on. No. I need 63. Well, I need 60. I need to remove one more instruction from this. And I do not know how. Maybe my fuel solution will work. But this is more complicated. This is more complicated because I need to call this thing without increasing recursion depth. Hmm. And I don't think that's possible, right? So what, what I do here is that this needs to be called at the same depth as these guys. Uh, but it needs to be called conditionally. And that's not just the condition on the depth. It's also a condition on whether or not it's inner. Uh, but I cannot... Huh. Right? I can reduce... I can remove this, kind of. I can't really... And I can do the same thing. I can do stack pointer less than. Oh no, I shouldn't change this in place. Wait a moment. Let me SP fuel. Right. I can remove these. I can try to do stack pointer here and here. Well, sign less. Yeah, unsigned less than, unsigned less than. I cannot change this. Or rather, I cannot do anything special with this call. Because it needs to go to the same depth as the other as, as the other guys. It needs it needs to go as deep as, as they are. So I need to call it at the same depth. 
Wait. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, actually, I need to call them. I need to call it at the, at a depth above them. So what I need to do, I believe, is I need to do well. If I'm using SP, I, I will do this, but I will kind of have to do stack pointer decrement and then stack pointer increment. Right, which brings me nowhere. Fortunately, this is still 64 if it works. Which it does. Um, mm, no, it doesn't. I wonder. I'm not. I'm not sure what the problem is here. Stack pointer. Stack pointer. Decrement. Oh no! I cannot. I cannot afford it. Of course, because the stack pointer. Stack pointer is not just size. I use stack pointer to know where to go back. No, but still. Oh no, but if I if I decrement it, then when I call now. Wait a minute. Okay, how about Maybe I could do something. I'm I'm not gonna do this live. I'm gonna try to do this off camera, but an idea I just got is I might be able to save an instruction here somehow by manually pushing a return address to stack and calling manually with a with a um, yeah well you know you know what i mean the, without using the call instruction so the call instruction kind of takes away a little bit of flexibility from me although it does save me an instruction but since i am already trying to do some shenanigans with the stack pointer perhaps i would be able to save here hmm no i'm afraid not i don't see anything i could do here i've i've been here a while and I cannot find a way to reduce this below. Well, this one I cannot reduce below 68. So I did get it to work with uh, uh, stack pointer comparisons by using a variable depth to which I go. Right. So uh, instead of keeping track of size and instead of uh, manually ma manipulating my current size while keeping the size limit fixed, Instead, I don't manipulate my size, but I manipulate my limit, right? So I increase the depth limit by one, and then I decrease the depth limit by one for this one. Which means all these guys will get called as usual. Uh, this actually doesn't exactly work because, well, it does somehow work, but it's not exactly perfect because uh, there's actually other stuff on the stack. So I put uh, the no inner variable onto the stack and if we take a look at this yeah see it it actually does some weird stuff once in a while but in the end it works similar to how less than versus less equal equals works yeah, and again the problem is i cannot uh, use the depth of the stack the size of the stack the stack pointer as a reliable way to determine my recursion depth because there is other stuff on the stack than the recursion depth. But yeah, like I said, I'm afraid I am unable to reduce this this one below 68 and that one below 64, which is unfortunate. I really don't know what else I can do. And it looks like I am going to have to, at least for now, maybe later in the video I'll we'll figure it out, but I'm going to have to leave this one unfinished. I'm, I have to give up, pretty much. I can, of course, you don't need to tell me that I can uh, 
make an ASIC that will solve this, but the point is make a an actual program for leg that can solve this in 63 bytes. I don't see a way. Oh well. Next up, a non-recursive program, which I think should also be useful, if not necessary, for creating an ASIC for this, because I don't know how I would make a recursive ASIC. I don't think that's even a thing you can reasonably do. Probably can, but I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I do have a re reasonably clear idea of what I want to do. But I'm afraid I cannot point to any particular place where I got the idea from. Uh, this is a fairly general thing about um, geometric structures overall. And it is coordinate systems. So what we did for our original program is we just gave relative directions. And we didn't really care where we are in an absolute sense. Now for any kind of curve on a plane, um, it actually kind of consists of points, and those points will have coordinates. Uh, I guess uh, probably the best... Uh, yeah, probably my best reference would be a three, the 3 blue, 1 brown video, as is often the case. 3 blue, 1 brown videos are great. Uh, so, yeah, I should... I'll try to link to it here. Uh, do go check it out. It's a great one, as always. Uh, but what I intend to do is not described there exactly, uh, because, of course, I work in a discrete world of a uh, finite approximation of a Hilbert curve. So uh, my mathematical object is going to be fairly weird. But the gist is the same, and I already come prepared. Here's our Hilbert curve. And what I did, you can see, is I've numbered every single step we make and every step it increases by one, right? So first we start at position zero, we do a step one, then two, then three, then four, and it keeps ticking up, right? And it is theoretically possible uh, from knowing the step number, from knowing where we are in terms of n, you know, in terms of time of how far we got along the curve, it is possible to find out the coordinates of the point in exact uh, or in absolute coordinates. So say we made 10 steps, this means we are here, which means we are on coordinate x this and on coordinate y this, right? Same thing, you know, 34, it's going to be coordinate x here and coordinate y here. Now, I believe this should be a fairly simple algorithm, although I have not yet implemented it, but I do have an idea. Now, in order to determine my coordinates from my step number, I am going to apply two main ideas. Uh, the first one is going to be the idea of quadrants. Now, as we've, as we've already seen for a while, as we've already been aware of for a while, uh, the Hilbert curve consists of a bunch of repetitions of the same pattern. It's a recursive fractal. And at the top level, the large thing consists of four repetitions of the same thing, right? Uh, they are somehow rotated or flipped, but the basic idea is the same. We have these four figures, which are equivalent among themselves, right? Um, so now, when I know my step number, say 39, I can actually pretty quickly tell which large quadrant I'm in. So let's call this is going to be my quadrant 0, this is going to be my quadrant 1, quadrant 2, and quadrant 3. How do I determine from my step number which quadrant I'm in? I'm in. Well, it's actually fairly simple. I know that each quadrant takes uh, 16 steps, right? 0 through 15, then 16 through 31. 
which means that in order to know my quadrant number, in order to know where I, where I am in the large figure, all I need to do is I need to find out how many times a 16 fits into my number. So if it fits none times, then I'm in quadrant zero. If it fits one time, then I've already done quadrant zero and I must be in one and so on and so forth. So that's actually just divide by 16, right? So large quadrant is n divided by 16. Uh, but why stop there? We can look at the smaller quadrant, divide that one into quadrants, and now I know that, again, it's four of the same thing, except now they take not, four, uh, not 16 steps, but they actually take four each. Uh, I know that I am some number of steps into this quadrant, and that number is going to be this length, right? And what this length is, is actually n mod 16, right? Because, you know, I remove this, I, I don't care about these, I have already done those. I take n mod 16, this is going to be my length into this quadrant. And then, how many times does 4 fit into my length? Well, it fits um, divided by 4 times. Is that even right? It should be, right? Yeah, it's it's about right. Uh, it's it's slightly weird because we're starting at zero, so it may seem strange, but um, yeah, that's that. And then, of course, why stop there? I can just take a look at, this, at the smallest quadrant and consider these things. So that is the basic idea. Uh, I am pretty sure this can be generalized. Yes, quite simple, really. Um, I just go, I can go bottom, bottom up instead of uh, top to bottom. I think it's going to be easier and probably more efficient. And I can start by determining where I am in a small quadrant. So say I am in nine. This means I need to find out that I am at step, uh, at quadrant, this is going to be so, it's a bit difficult to show, but this is this direction, which means 0, 1, 2, 3, right? Which means that 9 is a 1. This is a quadrant 1 on the smallest green scale. Now, it's, it's quite simple, really. I know that every smallest quadrant is 4 steps. So, how far I am along in my current unfinished small quadrant is going to be just n mod 4. So 1 is n mod 4. But now that I know this, what I can do is I can do n div 4, right? Well, n, n equals div 4 and div 4. And that already puts me into larger quadrant mode. Right, I am already disregarding these steps as ones. You know, I kind of combine them into one. Instead of them being counted as four steps, uh, they are counted as one step. And then I repeat the same thing. I basically consider... I'm running out of colors here, but... Um, basically consider this is one step. Then it goes here, right? Then it goes here. Then it goes here. So, zero, one, two, three. And now n div 4 mod 4 is going to be my blue position. So it's going to be this quadrant. Hopefully this makes some sense with the mess I'm making on the blackboard. Some Something along those lines. So that's kind of a, uh, a an iterative process where I take n mod 4 and div 4 and mod 4 and div 4 and mod 4 and div 4 and that way I can determine the stack of my quadrants from smallest to largest. Make sense? Sure hope it does. So let's just take a look at an example real quick. Let's say I am 
currently at step 52, right? So what my algorithm tells me to do is I'm going to be doing 52 mod 4. 52 mod 4 is 0, because 40 plus 12, right? Um, which means that in the small thing, in one of these tiny things, I am at step 0. So I am right here, right? Oops. Next up, oh, come on. I was going to group them. Um, next up, what I do is I do 50, 55 or 52 divided by 4. It's going to be what? Uh, 4 plus or 10 plus 3. It's going to be 13, right? Uh, and essentially what this does, what this divide by 4 does, is every small thing like this turns into a single dot in my picture, in my consideration. These are dots. And I am moving between them. Like so. Right? This is this is my new oops. Um that's not right. I'm moving like this, like this, and then like this. Yeah. Something along those lines. Now I know I am in the 13th dot here, which means 13 divided or 13 mod 4 puts me in 1. Yeah, that's correct. This means that in the small, in the smaller or larger thing, I am at step 0, 1. I am at quadrant 1. Next up, again, comes a reduction. I look at larger, at the largest picture, at this one. And so 13 divided by 4 is going to be 3. And then 3 mod 4 is going to put me at 3. Which means that in the huge picture, I am in point zero, one, two, three. I am here. So in terms of quadrants, I kind of know if I take a look, uh, if I take these and I combine them, I know that I am here in the big picture. Oh, come on. Group. I am here in the big picture. Next, I know that my big picture consists of smaller pictures, which means it goes kind of like this. And then this thing is itself uh, consisting of smaller pictures like that. And I am here. So I can kind of draw, you know, a path to, or that's not, that's not exactly right, but I can determine my position from relative coordinates. Now this still lacks a major part of the puzzle because of course, when we take a look at the actual picture, this is not what we see. What we see here, is this thing is flipped. Um, I cannot flip it the way I want to. It's flipped like so. <laughs> right? This is it. This is the thing. And we are here. But that is correct. It's just that we don't know how it's flipped. And the same thing goes for the green thing. It's also somehow flipped. Uh, yeah, it, it is flipped like so, right? And then we know. So now what we need to do is we need to start keeping track of rotations or flips. Now let's talk about flips. So we know our largest picture is a step like this. It consists of four quadrants. Let's draw those. And they are steps that are a repetition of the large thing, but they are somehow flipped. Let's take a look at what they look like. The top guys are actually exactly the same. They are not flipped. But the bottom guys are different. This one looks like this, and this one looks like this. 
Well, that is not a particularly complicated pattern. We can see that quadrants 1 and 2 are unchanged, while quadrants 0 and 3 are somehow flipped. Now, what these flips are, not going to go into too much detail. Uh, I, I think this, is, this will take me way too long to explain for no useful benefit. But this is a flip along the x equals y axis, right? So in order to turn this into this, I need to flip it along this direction, right? So this arrow will kind of go there. Unfortunately, I don't have a good animation, right? And this corner will go down here. So it's, it'll, be, it'll be a flip like this, but along this axis. Um, I, I don't have a good way to animate this. I'm sorry. 3 blue 1 brown video does have this animation and that's that might be useful if you are finding this hard to understand, but hopefully you get it. All right, so I know that my quadrant number zero has coordinates flipped relative to the x equals y um, large diagonal, larger diagonal. The third quadrant is actually flipped along this diagonal. So x equals minus y. So in order to get from this to this, what I need to do is I need to flip it along this axis, right? So my start goes here. This corner goes down here, the arrow remains, and this corner also doesn't move. Right? So that's that's what happens. These are fairly simple coordinate... Uh, coordinate... Uh, what do you call it? Operations. Which are easy to calculate. In fact, to show it off real quick, I'll just do a visual representation. We have an origin point. Let's say it's a point AB. In order to flip it over the X equals Y line, the blue line, what we do is we turn AB into BA. You can see the blue point here, right? And it's flipped relative to the X equals Y line. And for the X equals negative Y, what we do is we do minus B minus A, and that's what we get, right? So I have these two points. And that is the, um, man, I forget the word, the operation, the transformation that happens to the coordinates of our things in our quadrant. Now it's time to put it all together and to introduce an actual coordinate system. Uh, you may already be noticing that my zero is in a slightly weird spot. I did not put the zero in a corner anywhere, but instead my zero is smack dab in the middle of things. And perhaps even more interestingly, it's not on a point where the robot can stand. It's not actually on the line, it's in between lines. And even further, uh, all of my even coordinates are going to be off the curve. So it kind of goes like this, we have 0, 0, then we're going to have 0, 1 over here. And this can correspond to a spot on the track. But then we're going to have 0, 2. It's going to be this line, which is in between. Well, it's going to correspond to this line, which is in between steps. And so on and so forth. Every other coordinate will be in between steps. Uh, that's not actually necessarily important in itself. It's just there to accommodate for the zero in the middle. I think that makes the calculations easier. So then how do we use this coordinate system and what do we do next? Well, we've already discussed that with uh, knowing the step number, we've been considering 52. Um, knowing the step number, we can find out that this 52 is in some particular quadrant relative to the large thing. This is a coordinate is a coordinate system for the entire large thing, for the full giant red uh, step. 
but it's in the smaller quadrant. And what I can do is for the smaller quadrant, we can introduce its own relative coordinate system. We can now say that we have a new zero right here, our new origin point for the blue system is going to be, be here. It's going to have coordinate zero, zero, but relative to the red thing, it has an actual proper absolute coordinate, which is going to be negative, uh, actually four, negative four, right? It has an X of four, zero, one, two, three, four, and it has a Y of negative four, zero, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, right? So now, uh, let's just say, let's not go into the details of how exactly we're going to do that. Let's just say that for this coordinate system, we established that our 52 is right here. It's going to be in coordinates, uh, negative one and one, two, three, negative one, three, right? So minus one, three. Now, this is still relevant relative to this zero to a different origin point. But what we can do in order to make it relative to the actual origin is we can just use vector addition. We know that our four negative four, or we know that our origin point is actually four negative four. And from it, we go to negative one, three, which means that adding these together, we're gonna have four negative four plus negative one, three is going to equal three, negative one. And if we check, we may notice that that is in fact correct. One, two, three. So down on this line and negative one on this line. Here we are, 52. So this already kind of sets out a recursive procedure for how we can determine the coordinate of our point relative to the big thing from determining, wow, um, from, from determining relative coordinates, <laughs> determining coordinates relative to smaller things, we can determine the coordinate of the point relative to the larger things, which already, like I said, defines our recursive computation. Now, the only question is where does recursion stop? Um, well, no, there's t two questions. Where does it stop and how do we actually perform it? Uh, the stopping should be fairly simple. At some point we are going to end up with just this tiny thing. And for it, we just know that we have, you know, negative one, negative one, negative one, 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 and then one, negative one. And those are coordinates. However, there's one more issue that we need to take care of, and that is rotation. Let's just carry out an example computation with our 52, which we've already determined that its smallest quadrant in the green things is going to be zero, and in the blue things it's going to be one, and in the red thing it's going to be three. So since we know that in the green we are at zero, this means that our coordinate relative to this green system is going to be zero just to remind you this is what we are this is our zero this is our coordinate system which means negative one negative one right this is what we will have next for the blue thing we will know that we are in quadrant one which means that in the blue thing let me make it larger. We are in one. So over here. But the center of my new, my smaller coordinate system is going to be, it's going to go like, it's, it's going to look something like this. And the center, this point here, is going to be double the previous thing. It's going to be um, negative two, two. So this is negative two, right? We, we have a point in here on which we can actually stand. And this is two. And this also has a point on which we can stand. 
right? So something like this. So this origin is negative two, negative two. So we know that negative two, come on, negative, I can't type comma apparently, I can't type apparently, negative two, two. And for quadrant three, we know that the origin of the blue thing in it is going to be quadrant three is this. So we can just take a look here. I'm, I'm just eyeballing it right now. Of course, this is all generalizable to very simple mathematical formulas. Uh, this is going to be four negative four, right? So four, come on, comma, negative four. This is red and that is green. So that, this right here, is the sequence of origins relative to which our coordinates happen. In fact, this negative one, negative one can also kind of be seen as an origin of the coordinate system in the middle of which we are, but it's kind of just a generalization thing. So now from these, I'm going to need to establish the actual coordinate relative to the red. We're going to be going bottom up. And the first thing we're going to do, well, bottom up like, like so. Uh, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to determine the coordinates of our point in question relative to the blue thing, right? We already know the coordinates relative to the green thing. And we'll need coordinates relative to blue, then relative to red. So we know that in green, we are negative one, negative one. This is our green setup. However, since we know that this green thing is inside quadrant one relative to the blue, this means that relative to the blue, it is flipped. Actually, no, <laughs> sorry, it isn't. Uh, we're lucky quadrant one is not flipped. So we can actually just do our addition without any flippage. So relative to blue, our coordinate is going to be um, negative two, two, plus minus one, minus one, and it's equal to negative three, one, right? So what we what we established is we had we kind of had this and I know this is not exactly right because we don't have rotations still uh, but we kind of had this vector and then we had this vector and what we did is we added them together and we got this vector but now this negative three one is our new blue coordinate so negative three one is blue just type it here. But what we need to do next is we need to establish, we need to translate this relative coordinate to a coordinate relative to the red origin. And this is where rotations finally come into play because we are in the third quadrant, which means three is just to remind you, it's over here, it's gonna be a flip relative to the X equals negative Y axis, which turns a B into negative b negative a remember i showed it in desmos i don't know how to pronounce desmos just realized um so we need to flip this thing just like that which means we get negative one and three right so what we did is we had our thing it is in the coordinate system I cannot actually show flippage. So we knew that it's here. We knew that it's this vector, right? And before actually adding it to anything, we need to flip it or I am emulating flippage with rotation. We need to do something like this. And doing that is this formula. So that's what we do, negative one, three. And now we have an actual proper vector and we can actually add it. So four negative four plus negative one three equals what we get is 
3 and negative 3. Is that right? No, that's not right at all. Negative 1. Let's check. 0, 1, 2, 3. So 3 is our x. And then negative 1 is our y. And where do we end up? Exactly where we wanted to. Exactly where we expected. Um, as is often the case, I am aware my explanation is not complete and not perfect, but I cannot really go into all the details of everything. Hopefully this makes some sense. I'm going to jump to the next part now. Next part being a Python implementation of the algorithm we just discussed. So I went ahead and implemented this thing. It's a single function. You can see it's fairly short, although it looks short in Python, but I'm pretty sure compiled into assembly, this would be huge, <laughs> uh, but that's a problem for later. Uh, right now, let's quickly discuss this one. Um, so yeah, we take as input a single number. This is going to be our step number along the Hilbert curve. So 12, for example, and we spit out the pair of coordinates we are actually at relative to the top level coordinate system. So how this operates is fairly simple. We go bottom up and we iterate over all depths as we have to. So this thing for uh, kind of corresponds to iterating over all sizes like this, right? So we start at the green size, then we go to the blue size, then we go to the red size and so on if necessary. It isn't for our, in our case. And at each point, at each iteration, at each depth, we determine our um, quadrant. So Q stands for quadrant. We know that we are at some point along the current depth. And then depending on the quadrant, we're going to be doing coordinate transformations like this. So there's four quadrants, four possible kinds of coordinate transformations. Uh, so first, let's take a look at just the signs here. Um, you may notice in quadrant, in quadrant zero, we have X minus and Y minus, which corresponds to, you know, the minus minus direction. It's going to be this arrow, which happens to coincide with quadrant zero. Uh, with quadrant one, we have X minus Y plus, right? So negative X, positive Y, it's going to be this arrow, which corresponds to quadrant one and so on and so forth. So two will correspond to this and three will correspond to this in terms of signs. Now this offset thing is actually encoding the size of the arrow we need to move by. So at every iteration, we will need a larger offset, right? We start at offset equal one, and that is the offset of the smallest thing. But then offset equal two will be the offset of the blue guy right, multiplied by two is going to be this kind of offset. And then multiplied by two again, so multiplied by four, it's going to be the huge red offset. So it's going to be four. Um, so that's that. And finally, uh, this also just in line encodes the flippage. You may notice that in cases zero and three, X and Y coordinates are actually flipped. So y becomes the shifted x and x becomes the shifted y and in case three same thing y x instead of x y but also in case three you may remember we needed minus b minus a so they're also both negated so that's what happens and then we just prepare for the next step um, for the next iteration we divide step by four as discussed uh, we move on to the next size and we multiply offset by two. Again, I already explained that. So that's how we get to x, y. But of course, since I have effectively total graphics, uh, it's not enough for me to just map all steps and get coordinates. I actually need to trace this, uh, you know, this shape with my robot, which means I need relative directions. But determining relative direction from 
an algorithm that can give you exact coordinates is pretty simple. All I need is just, I calculate my points at the current step. So x0, y0 is the current step. Then I calculate next step. And having calculated both, I pretty much know, if I know the point from and point to, it's a trivial calculation of where, in terms of relative directions, I need to go. So that's what I do. Uh, this is just, this is a naive implementation. I expect to optimize this uh, in, the, in the future. But yeah, if we take a look real quick, steps from XY run. Let's check this out. Lo and behold, it all works. It draws Hilbert curve of the order we need. So this is all good. However, I don't think <laughs> this will be an efficient solution. Yes, I could optimize this a bunch, or at least a bit, especially in the steps from XY part, uh, where I call the function twice instead of just, you know, uh, calculating the next step and keeping track of the current step. Uh, but still, I would like to improve this somehow. So here's an idea. What I'm doing with my original approach is I'm calculating coordinates and then I get a vector from them. But importantly, this kind of does a lot of unnecessary work, right? I calculate an actual pair x0, y0, and then I calculate an actual pair x, y, y1, x1, y1, which I never use, right? I don't care where I am in the picture at all. All I need these coordinates for is the relative difference of them, right? I need to know how x1 is different from x0 and how y1 is different from y0. And the rest I just don't care about. So immediately my mind jumps to the idea of somehow not calculating these two things separately, but instead just trying to focus on this subtraction, right? And trying to implement my recursive function in such a way that it immediately calculates this value. And, well, my original approach, well, my original idea would be to just, uh, you know, substitute x1 for its uh, corresponding expression, you know, for the computation that it is, which we will know it's going to be some kind of, you know, uh, one minus offset plus another offset minus minus another offset. It's going to be some kind of uh, expression, right? But then I know that I am subtracting from it another expression, which will have the same offsets, right? Because offsets are always uh, the same. It's always, uh, you know, the smallest offset of one, then an offset of two, then an offset of four. And I was hoping it would reduce, but it doesn't look like it does. Uh, it's still it's still like complex computation, which doesn't really, uh, you know, improve things. However, I still think this idea is something to pursue. And I think what I can do instead is I can go even more abstract and I can ditch coordinates completely and instead think of just pure vector spaces. I, I don't know if that would actually be called a vector space, but just purely think of vectors because um, so when we, when we do our original coordinate algorithm, what we check out is first we look at the smallest thing and we find out where we are in it, right? So for example, we are in this point. But importantly, I know that when I am at this point in the smallest thing, I actually have a particular direction in which I intend to go. I do have this vector. Right? So I can determine a vector relative to my, well, it's going to look like this, relative to my green coordinate system. I can determine a vector in which I need to go. But then when I move on to the next point, to the next, uh, you know, um, depth level thing, I know that I need to rotate this picture, but well, Instead of rotating this coordinate, 
what what I can do is I can just rotate the vector, right? Rotating a vector is not a particularly difficult operation either. It should be doable. So I would, uh, you know, I would have my initial assumption, like say I am uh, here. I would have my initial vector pointing up, but then I would realize that it needs to be rotated like this. And I would know that this vector is pointing right. So um, I don't think I'm going to go into the details of how I actually implement it. So instead, I expect a jump cut to an actual implementation with vectors as the primary, mm, you know, unit of computation, the primary unit of concern. Actually, now that I think of it, there is another challenge here, though I'm pretty sure we'll be able to overcome it. And it's actually related to the very first thing I was... Uh, I had difficulties with when trying to implement the, the very first solution for the Hilbert curve here. Uh, and it's the fact that when I'm here, I know my direction. When I'm here, I know my direction. When I'm here, I know my direction. But when I have completed my current um, step, I don't know where I'm going, right? Here. I, I'm going to the right, well, to the left, really, whilst here, I'm going forward. And that cannot be established from just looking at the small picture. This needs to be established by looking at the large picture. However, I, I still think this should be pretty simply overcome. And all I need to do is I'm going bottom to top, you know, the, what's, what's it called? Yeah, you get the idea. Um, and once I have analyzed my small thing, if I realize that I am in the third quadrant, I just still don't know what my direction is. And I reduce right here. I turn this into a point. And then I try again. And that will be my initial direction. And this is kind of the concept of getting out of the step, right? Going out. This is the arrow out of the step. Um, so yeah, right here, if I am in third, I didn't know, but now that I have upgraded to the larger picture, I know because essentially I am in the very first part of my blue thing, right? So, and the vector is actually exactly the same. It's, it's, uh, since, since all my vectors are the same length, they are length one, uh, I can establish this quite easily. And, uh, again, if I were say in 15 right here, then I still don't know, but this entire thing reduces to a single point and I go up to the red picture, and then in the red picture, I know because there I am, right? And then at the very end, I don't know where to go, but that is entirely reasonable because the end has nowhere to go. So I think this should be reasonably simple. Oh yes, check this out. So we have our four directions. We have right, down, left, up. And they are encoded by numbers. This is just what's given to us by the, you know, fast bot interface. And these are essentially our direction vectors. They're not, they don't exactly look like vectors, but they are. Uh, they, they just encode, you know, unit vectors for, mm, well, you know, right is this and down is this and so on. Um, and I can literally work with them. So that's what I do. Hilbert vector takes a step input, takes the, again, the number of how far along the Hilbert curve we are. And what it outputs, it is, it outputs that vector. So this is exactly what we want now. And this consists of two loops. I couldn't figure out how to compress this into one loop. So that might be a point of future improvement, but for now, uh, the first thing we do is this loop 
just skips all third quadrants. So we start at the, at the smallest um, step, at the smallest size. And if we are in third, right? So if Q is equal to three, then we loop and we reduce. So we do step divided by four and we get our new quadrant, right? We go to this picture. Then if this picture is also, also comes out in third, then again, we loop and so on and so forth until we find some quadrant that is not third. This is what I just explained because uh, the third from the third quadrant, we cannot establish where we actually need to go. Um, so that's what happens. This just skips all the small third quadrants, right? Now, next thing we have found our initial direction, which happens to be this. I'm not going to go into the details uh, of how exactly these pluses and minuses work here, but essentially they are kind of rotations. It's just uh, instead of having a match clause like we had here, you know, uh, we could match quadrant with, you know, check quadrant zero, quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three. It just so happens that I can reduce this case clause into this case expression into a single arithmetic thing like this. I, I'm not going to explain it fully. I'm not going to prove it. It works. Just me. <laughs> so yeah, this, this way we can initialize our direction. So again, this means we have found some point along some level for which we know a definite direction like this. So that is our initial direction. And next we start the second loop. And what the second loop does is having already got the initial direction, we no longer set it. We no longer uh, reset this direction to anything new, but instead what we do is we do rotations. So this construction is actually exactly the same as this. This is just uh, kind of a go to next depth thing, right? So we establish a new quadrant Q, we reduce our step. So we reduce the thing divided by four. I have explained this a million times by now. And uh, yeah, D also corresponds to how far I have gone in my depths, because I need my depths to be at most three at most size, right? I do not want to go beyond the red size. I start at green size, then I go blue size, then I go red size. And what this D keeps track of is that I don't go further into some huge size. So that's all it is. And yeah, once we have established the quadrant, we know that the top two quadrants, so quadrant one and quadrant two need no rotation, right? They are exactly the same and they have the same uh, orientation as the big thing. However, the zeroth quadrant and the third quadrant need rotations. So that's what we do. If our quadrant is zero, then I rotate my vector. And again, this three minus direction is just a reduction of a match clause on Q, match uh, expression on Q. Same thing here. One minus direction just happens to correspond to a certain match thing on Q. And what these do is they rotate my vector in the direction I need them to be rotated. And as you can see, that's actually it. I already have my result. And this looks pretty short to me. This looks like a pretty short assembly program. Uh, not to say it looks like an even smaller ASIC, but we'll get to that later. Um, so yeah, then I just return direction and I made a quick uh, wrapper to actually go over all steps and we can run it and we can check that it does in fact still work. So now it's time to get back to the game. Well, I am afraid this still wasn't enough. As you can see, I am at 68 bytes here. And so far, I haven't been able to reduce this any further. 
Uh, but this does work. This is an, a compilation of this algorithm to assembly compiled using my head. <laughs> uh, so I guess let's go over this real quick. It's uh, mostly the same. So we have two loops still. This is our first loop. This is the wild true thing. Uh, we search for a quadrant that is non three. Otherwise, we keep looping. And this block of code, you know, the increment of my depth, uh, get the next quadrant and then uh, divide step by four. Since it happens twice, I decided to encapsulate it as a function or whatever the word would be generalize, whatever, abstract. So this is essentially a procedure next quad. This gets me my next quadrant because and it's, it gets called twice. This unfortunately, this doesn't actually save anything. This doesn't save me any lines of code, any bytes uh, because of the overhead of uh, the function return and calling the function. This kind of costs, not kind of, this does cost exactly the same as if I had this in line twice. I just decided this would be somewhat cleaner. So yeah, this is the first loop. It does this until we find a quadrant that is non three. Next, exactly the same thing. Direction equals quadrant plus three. And next, this is a slightly interesting thing. Uh, the more natural construct, as we've already seen for assembly is a repeat until, you know, the more natural loop where you have a label, then it does the first iteration always, and then it can loop back if some condition holds. So that would be the equivalent of a repeat until. But here, I necessarily need this to be a while. And uh, that's that's because I don't want to do this uh, too many times if I already know that I well, no, if I have only found direction when I'm already at the very end and I don't need to rotate anything anymore. And I don't need, don't want to do any iterations of this at all. So this necessarily is a while, which is a construction like this. Uh, when I enter it, I enter it at the end and then it checks and jumps back. So it's, it's, it's another unconditional jump. And then the exact same thing happens. We call next quad. So this is that block and we have some conditional flips of the vector like so. That's it. Then we do this a bunch of times and then we return direction. Uh, there is, however, a slight overhead, which is kind of invisible in this Python in that it's not enough for me to just implement this as a function that takes a single step number in. Uh, I need to trace the entire Hilbert curve, which means I need to run this for all steps, which means I need to keep track of the step, right? This thing just needed to work on one step while I need to be able to increment step and uh, do something with it. And that actually comes with more complexity than uh, one might expect. Well, more than I initially expected, because right here, if you take a look, what I do is I mutate step, right? I say step is step divided by four, but that just doesn't work for me if I need to keep track of step. So instead, what I do is over here in next quad in this function, instead of dividing step by four, what I maintain is I maintain a shift. And this is going to be the number I divide step by. So at first I divide step by shift equals one, uh, which by the way, I renamed sav to load immediate. This is li. This is just, this just puts one into shift. Um, I need to reset this shift every time and at every iteration, this shift gets multiplied by four. So this is essentially the same as dividing step by four, but instead I multiply by four, the thing I am dividing by, <laughs> um, but this comes with its own pain point of, you know, having to reset this shift and having to keep track of it and all sorts. So unfortunately, this is at 68 still, and I've been at it for a while and I do not see anything I could improve here. Well, 
I've been at this for quite some time now. And I even asked around on Discord, as you can see. And thank you kindly to a billion grape and Tard Insanity and uh, Ender Shadow for all the tips and suggestions. Uh, they have been helpful, but I'm afraid none have been helpful enough to get me under 64 bytes. I am seriously starting to worry I might have to abandon this challenge and just go with an ASIC at this point. Fast forward 100,000 years. I just couldn't let it go, and I think I have progress. So this is my original function, this is the one I just showed. And this, right here, is my new approach. And what this does is this gets rid of the double loop. This That was the biggest problem, the thing I disliked the most about my original solution. And it was the fact that I have two loops which really start the same. This block of d plus one, q step, d plus one, q step, they are the same things. They happen at the start of, of each iteration, and the only difference is the second part of what happens in the loop. There was, however, another prob problem, and it was this assignment. It was this direction assignment. This was my initial direction assignment, which needs to happen only once, and it kind of doesn't need to be. It must not be looped, it must not be repeated twice. So I was able to put this all in a pretty neat single loop uh, for which I used a trick. Uh, so we have this loop, we have it starting the same way, right? It's still a while and it has this block at the start, but now this block only needs to happen once. And the things that happen in the other two loops are kind of two parts of this one. So this will be this loop. Uh, this It will include the direction equals uh, q plus 3. And this will be the second loop. This part. Right? And there's just a switch that's going to happen that will turn us from executing this every time to executing this every time. So what that switch is, is, <laughs> as you have probably already noticed, is direction equals 100. So 100 is just any random unnatural value. It must be a value of direction which I would not get under normal operation. So my direction can be anything. It can be 0, 1, 2, 3 at any point in the loop. Uh, because I am rotating somehow, I'm rotating randomly in all sorts of directions. But importantly, it will not get this large. So if I set my direction to an initial value of 100, then as long as it's still 100, this means it just hasn't been set yet. So direction q plus direction equals q plus 3 simply hasn't happened yet. Because if it did, then no amount of rotation would get us to 100. Um, actually, I'm kind of explaining this backwards. Uh, this could be a boolean, right? I could have direction set equals false, and then I would have uh, direction set equals true here once I have set direction. But that's kind of costly. And that is something I am really trying to avoid because I every, every instruction counts. Uh, so, yeah, this was a big realization for me. Uh, so, obviously, once direction is not equal to 100, we're going to be doing this every time, which is exactly this second while loop. But while direction is still initial direction, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be checking our q equals 3. So it's the same thing as this. And if we find some q, some quadrant that is non-3, then we set our initial direction and we skip. In fact, we uh, so long as direction wasn't yet set, we always skip this, and this is kind of what allows us to just run the first loop at first, and then this skip stops happening, but the entire if, if also stops happening, so this block just keeps looping every time, just keeps iterating. 
So hopefully, hopefully, this will allow me to save just enough bytes to get me under the line to allow me to pass the bar. This does have, of course, this does have uh, an overhead. You know, I need an initial direction set, which is an instruction. And I also need these ifs here. I need this continue, which is kind of new to me. Uh, but yeah, hopefully I should be able to compile this to something smaller. Let's see. Check this out. 60 bytes. I was able to compile this program into assembly and it's a mere 15 instructions. 60 bytes. I'm not yet sure if this actually works because I want to capture the Steam achievement on camera. So it'll be embarrassing if it doesn't. But this seems to be working on the first few steps. I've had to make a couple changes. Um, why is it 101, 100? I've had to make a couple of changes to assembly to actually get it under 64 so compared to this. So let me go over this real quick. Um, it starts the same. We have uh, initial direction as 100. It doesn't really matter. One, 101 would have done just as well. Uh, and we still have our Hilbert loop, which is the big loop that goes over each step of the Hilbert curve. Uh, I still need to reset my shift every time, but now the new thing, this is a new piece of overhead. Uh, this is direction equals 100. I load my initial direction as direction every time I need to recalculate it. And now starts the big loop. So it's a single loop now, which is great. And yet another cool thing about it is now that it's a single loop, I do not actually need to make sure that it is a while because the first iteration is safe. So you may notice that I do not have this unconditional jump to loop end right here, which saves me an instruction, right? So I, I can just fall into it and this is a repeat until. Uh, however, that does come at a cost uh, <laughs> still. Uh, you may notice that this block which corresponds to my, uh, you know, getting the next quadrant, is missing a thing. It's missing the shift increment. And I've had to move shift increment to the end. And this is because I still kind of need while-like properties of this, uh, which I'm going to go into uh, slightly later. So, yeah, the... The shift increment happens at the end of the loop as opposed to at the start of the loop, but that doesn't really influence anything too much. So next we come to our if construction, if chain, this is that. Uh, it's pretty much exactly the same, but this is the place where the shift at the end and this label comes into play. Uh, when I do a continue, it is assumed that once I continue, the while condition, the while, uh, goodness, what's it called? I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it the loop condition, uh, needs to get checked. Which is why I cannot just unconditionally jump to loop. Again, I need to, I need the condition to be checked. So this is kind of a while-like structure at the same time. Um, and of course I need the shift to be incremented. So that's, that happens here as well. Uh, the rest is exactly the same as before. So this is my rotation ifs and they are the same as this. And then we output our direction. So that's all good. However, initially this actually wasn't enough to get me under 64 bytes. My program for this, my original implementation of this was exactly 64 bytes. And the problem with, with it was this. What I used to have is I used to have, as you may recall, step equals step plus one. I had this instruction which needed to keep track of how far along the Hilbert curve I am. You may see that it is no longer there. And the secret is a hack right here. 
you may notice that this is not a jump, this is a call. Instead of jumping to the start of my loop, what I do is I unconditionally, quote unquote, call it. And really, this is not a function. It's never gonna get. It's I'm never gonna return from this function. There's no move from uh, stack to the IAR. It doesn't ever finish. This is an infinite recursion, basically. But importantly, what it does is it kind of utilizes the built-in capabilities of my hardware. That is the capability of the you call instruction to both perform a jump and increment the stack pointer at the same time to save me an instruction. So now, instead of doing an, a manual increment here, all I do is I do the call, and in order to know what's incremented, I just get my step from the stack pointer. And that's it. This actually, this final hack got me over or under the bar of 64 bytes. Are we ready to start this yet? Are we ready to run it? Okay, wish me luck. I really hope this team achievement goes through and really hope it gets captured and really hope this recording doesn't get corrupted or anything. I hope I am recording. Uh, but we are under 60 bytes and so far it's looking good. I'm mostly worried about this transition over here as we're exiting the second large quadrant and entering the third large quadrant. By this point, we will have encountered pretty much all. Yes, all combinations. So, yeah. At this point, I'm pretty confident. And... Come on, Steam. What are you doing? I don't think I don't think I got the achievement at all. <laughs> Why? That looks broken. I'm definitely at under 64 bytes. I am certainly at under 64 bytes. Let me go check. Yep. Nope. I think the achievement is bugged. Complete the robot race with less than 64 bytes of code. I definitely have less than 64 bytes of code. I have 60 bytes of code. And I did complete it, but it just won't work. I guess let's run it at 10 kilohertz. Still nothing. Well, that's a letdown. I mean, it's not that it really matters. I know that I completed it. But kind of anticlimactic, I guess. Oh, well. I should file a bug report. And I am also ready to proceed to implementing this as an ASIC. There. This video is already more than long enough, so I decided not to bore you with the details of actually working through this. This actually turned out to be fairly simple. And uh, by the way, what you're seeing is a naive approach. It's a pretty direct implementation of the assembly. And I think I should be able to optimize this further in the future if I ever decide to. Uh, but I haven't actually tested this either, so we'll see. I am afraid this might give me the Steam achievement and I want to capture that. Uh, but let me just uh, walk you through this real quick. It's actually fairly simple. So let's start at the... Well, at the start, at the beginning of the circuit. We have no inputs at all, so level input is just hanging there. Uh, instead, what we have is our input is just a counter. So this is kind of our step counter and every tick we're going to proceed to the next step and we will have our output immediately. So this is a specialized counter. I was actually able to reuse a circuit, uh, a reduced counter circuit, which I used for Hanoi because I don't need 255. I only need 64 numbers in the counter. So yeah, we have the counter and then immediately it is disassembled. It is split using a byte splitter. And I take from it three kind of um, belts, whatever you call it, three buses of numbers. And this corresponds directly to this part. Uh, as we know, 
modulo 4 and divide by 4 in terms of bits is just pretty simple bit operations. So when we take modulo 4, this is actually just taking two of the first bits and then divide by 4 is actually a shift right by 2. So I don't even need to do any operations here. I can just disassemble my byte immediately. So essentially, and these colors do actually correspond to the colors I have been generally using. Uh, so the green is going to be literally the number of the quadrant in the green picture in the small uh, step. Blue is going to be the number of the blue quadrant and then red is going to be the number of the big red quadrant. Uh, next, they are all processed completely. So after this line, after this point, I am not using quadrants at all. So the first thing I should probably go into is this. Um, naming components is not my strongest suit. So 3 plus underscore B4 means 3 plus base 4. We are counting in base 4 kind of, right? We have uh, modulo 4 arithmetic and I have two bits representing base 4 numbers. So what this does is this is just a constant addition of plus 3 to our number. So essentially, as our input, we have the quadrant, this is Q. And as our output, we have this right here. So direction equals Q plus 3 is going to be this, right? So this is direction if calculated based on, on the first quadrant, on the green quadrant. This is going to be direction if calculated on the second quadrant. And this is direction calculated based on the third quadrant. Or not second, third, but uh, blue and red quadrants. Uh, so that's that. Um, next, I guess, logically, it would help to talk about... Uh, let's, let's disregard the X, nor and end for now. And let's talk about this bottom part. This is kind of the brains of the operation, and this is what actually does rotation and actually um, updates my direction based on these inputs. And you can see the inputs run all over the place. Uh, this There is a system to this madness, by the way. This is perfectly scalable to the right and down, so I could encode any Hilbert size with this, so it's, it's actually neat, even if it doesn't look like it. Um, so, first of all, there's this kind of block. And this kind of block consists of two blocks itself. There's this part down below, and there's another mux which it runs into. So what this is, is a rotation um, component, essentially. So we have three minus and one minus, also base four which encode this operation, right? We have direction equals three minus direction and direction equals one minus direction. So they are hard-coded uh, uh, subtraction components, which actually, they are ridiculously cheap. It's like not, not, not. And this is just a single not, so they are very nice. And so, so is three plus, by the way. So it's a very simple component. Um, so this thing, performs rotation and based on this mux we can decide which rotation we want to perform if we perform it. Now if we are not performing uh, rotation at all then this mux can let us decide whether we want the plane input or the rotated input, the, the thing down below. Uh, so at this point I think it makes sense to talk about the white wires and the white wire is going to be, there's only two of them, right? You can see there's this XNOR into a white wire and this XNOR into a white wire. Uh, and what the white wire does is it decides whether or not we want rotation at all. So as we know, we want rotation if Q is zero or three, right? And that's literally what they encode. XNOR is a component that for a base four number, if we assume that its input is uh, the two bits of the base four number, it outputs a one on a zero and on a one, or sorry, on a three. So this is essentially Q equals zero or Q equals three, 
then we have the white wire glowing, and then this mux lets through the rotated version. Same thing happens here. This is going to be the first rotation, and this is going to be the second rotation. So now the final part, and it's going to be the yellow wires. And yellow wires actually kind of do two things at the same time. They have two, two jobs. The first one, the more simple one, is determining whether or not we are in Q equals 0 or in Q equals 3. So as we've already seen, these blue or sorry, these white wires already gate us against uh, unnecessary rotation. So at the point when when we know that some rotation is happening, we already know that it's going to be either a zero or a three. So in order to distinguish between them, it's actually enough to just check equality to one of them, right? I don't need kind of don't need two ifs. Instead, I have an if rotation up here and then if equals zero and else. So that's what this is. This thing is my if for switching between rotations and it's based on this and which is checking for a three. So if we are Q equals three, then we're going to do one minus. So you can see one minus. Otherwise, we are always doing three minus, right? So this is rotation. This is whether or not rotation is necessary. And now comes, so this is exactly the same, except of course this happens uh, at the green level. Well, this happens at the blue level. So they are two different rotations. And now the final part, which is also encoded by these yellow wires and is a, it's a part that yellow wires are responsible for. Uh, it is the idea of skipping quadrants that are three. So this Q not equal three, then direction set. Uh, what we have right here is a decision of whether or not we want to accept the first direction, the first thing, the green thing, as our actual direction that was set, then it is rotated necessarily. Uh, and we need to decide, do we want to actually accept it? Or is it completely nonsensical? Because this quadrant was three, and actually it should have been skipped. And instead, we start at the direction of the blue quadrant. And that's what this max does. So if the first quadrant was three, so it's again this end, right? S similar to an XNOR, this uh, returns one on a uh, base four number that is three. Uh, if this end is on, this means that our first quadrant was three, which means that we do not want to use it and we do not want it rotated. We don't want it at all. But instead, we completely disregard all this and we just jump to the next available direction, which is the blue direction. And then the next thing, thing happens here. This is, again, the same mux as this, uh, except it's not enough to check the blue quadrant we actually need to check that both quadrants, both previous quadrants were three, right? We need to maintain this kind of state, which is why this end is here. And uh, if I were to go down, just for this problem size, it just happens that I only need one end. But if, if we were to go down further, we could have something else here. Well, if, if the Hilbert curve was larger, um, we would add one this way, right? And then it would grow downward like so, right? And then another one, you know, and so on and so forth. But it just happens to be, to not be necessary. And yeah, that's it. Uh, this is all automatically mod four. So we just combine our mod four number with a, with a byte maker and output it directly. Why is it mid run? Why is it a three? Oh no, it's not. Okay, um, like I said, I haven't actually run this yet, so let's see if it works. And also, let's hope I get the Steam achievement now. I kind of still want it.
even though I achieved it, I I know I get I got it. Technically, I I didn't get the pop up. Let's go. Ooh, that was snappy. Yes, <laughs> robot race with less than sixty four bytes of code. Ah, cool, captured, captured on camera. Uh, I've actually had uh, a discussion in Discord. I think this uh, this achievement is worded weirdly. Or not even just worded, graded weirdly. Like, he here it is. Complete the robot race with less than 64 bytes of code. 64 bytes of code. This right here, 64 bytes of code, really strongly, at least to me, suggests using code using a program component in a Turing complete machine and writing assembly that is below 64 bytes and besides that was the original statement of the problem right this was in the original level description level log right here among the robots that complete the course the winner is the one who had the smallest program but of course, there's no program component here. A program does not apply to an ASIC. So that is in fact why, and this is kind of an instance of a more general thing where I think ASICs are cheating. That is in fact why I put so much effort into trying to actually complete this uh, achievement properly by writing actual assembly for an actual Turing complete architecture. Now I understand, and in fact, I already made one. Um, no, not here. I understand that we can cheat completely for the Hilbert problem, for the Hilbert curve. We can just write a quote unquote program, which looks like this. Right? I can hard code all of my moves. It just happens to be 63 moves exactly. I need moves 0 through 62. And I hard code them into my program. I create a binary file, cheat.bin, and this works. And in fact, this is kind of efficient, you know, it has delay score of 12 and the gate score of 90, but this is just not fun, this is not interesting. And if this is really the intended solution for the achievement as it is worded and as it is graded, then, man, I, I don't know, that's just not... That doesn't seem interesting. Or did the developers actually intend for the insane amount of hacks and the insane amount of work I've put into my solution? Is this, uh, wherever that is, is this actually intended with the U call and with the shifts and with everything, with this initial direction and XY coordinates and vector rotations? Is this the intended solution? Honestly, I'm having a hard time believing that. This seems too complex for a Steam achievement, especially considering all the other ones. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm really curious to find out if this was actually intended or if something like this was intended. I mean, one other way I've been told is by, of course, I can modify leg to be more powerful. Uh, the most efficient thing I can see would be variable length instructions where I wouldn't need stuff like this, which would save me a lot of bytes immediately. And then the absolutely regular uh, recursive solution would work. You know, we could save one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bytes. Uh, I don't know if I counted it right, but yeah, we could save a bunch just by having variable length instructions. But this means modifying leg. And I would say that variable length instructions would be a modification beyond the quote-unquote vanilla leg, the one that we've been taught. Like, okay, then I might as well solve it on the RISC-V implementation in Turing Complete in one byte or whatever. I don't know. It just seems weird to me. Anyway, I'm through. I have completed everything. My score is great. My achievement is fully deserved so far as I'm concerned. I did it in less than 60 bytes of actual real code. We are sitting at the score of 
65, which looks like it counted. <laughs> it counted my cheat.bin solution as the more efficient one than my ASIC, but uh, I'm not giving up yet. I might improve my ASIC beyond that, uh, like I said, but we'll see. For now, I'm done.